What do you guys view a fight as? Like, what is a fight to you? If I asked you. Um, it's usually um, started by me. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> it usually involves a lot of hair pulling. So fighting is problem solving. And if you have yeah. that, if you have that mentality, then it doesn't matter how big the fight, who the opponent is, what the situation is, you can solve the problem. There's always a solution. There's always a way to do things. You just have to pivot. Maybe you want it to do things a certain way and it's not working. Well, if you keep forcing it, it's just going to make it worse. You go, okay, let's go around the other way. Let's, let's do something else. Like you just said, that just because one thing isn't going doesn't mean that you can't go a different route. And if you start to apply this mentality to everything, you guys will see there's always a way to, to, to go around this, the problem or the situation. You just have to change the mindset from like, I'm in a fight to there's a problem in front of me. Let's solve this problem. Under all is the land, real, real real estate. Courtney, your friends about to show you how to generate wealth. Get educated, do for yourself. Add a couple notches to your belt. Under all. Welcome to Under All is the Land, Season 5. I'm your host, Courtney Polis, here with my rock star co-stars, Silka Fernal. Hello. And Dominique Madden. Hello. I actually feel like it's the perfect time for us to start Season 5 because we've had so many things that have happened recently that would be causing new seasons in our lives. I Especially just had a baby. <laughs> yes. So. Yay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I had a home birth. It was amazing. Five minutes. That's really short. <laughs> <laughs> and your other one was what, like 30 minutes 15 or something? 15 minutes. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. That was really. Wow. Home birth. If anybody out there is watching this and doesn't know about it, I'd be very, very happy to share my story because um, I'm an advocate for natural birth. I just feel like we get brainwashed that things are more painful than they actually are. Anyway, that's she's my experience. so perfect. Yeah. She's the most perfect. She's so perfect. She's the cutest. So, but this week, also huge news in real estate. We had the results of the Sitzer Burnett case. So those of you who are following know that the Sitzer Burnett case was a class action lawsuit where over 500,000 sellers in Missouri uh, sued a few very large uh, corporate brokerages, but also the National Association of Realtors and the plaintiffs prevailed. And their claim was that the real estate brokerages colluded to increase the inflate the sales costs of homes because sellers had to pay buyers agents. They thought it was a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy. Everybody's anti Not a theory. Right? A conspiracy. So to everybody's keep it. colluding to keep the sales prices yes. high. Yes. So let's start at the beginning. Silka, <laughs> what is buyer agency and why should people want buyer agency? Well, it is uh, funny you should ask. <laughs> it's a beautiful tool. It protects your buyer. It, um, it, you know, so your, your buyer has his, his own representation, his or her own representation. Um, in their journey of buying and finding a home. Right. So like and it's a very valuable thing. It is and valuable. It's a very consumer pro it's it's protecting the consumer. Right. It so helps it, both sides. It was invented to protect the consumer. So right. it's invented so that buyers are able to have a real advocate in their process of purchasing a home because obviously um, sellers and listing <clears throat> agents who have a fiduciary responsibility to the sellers are not gonna always be in the buyer's corner even though you know the rules say they need to be honest and that kind of thing i think the reality is when you have a fiduciary responsibility to a seller you don't want to violate the fiduciary responsibility and act like you're representing the buyer too right especially if you're in a state where dual agency doesn't exist where one person can't be represented by um you know the buyer and seller can't be represented by one agent or one brokerage so Buyer agency, the pluses of buyer agency are that the buyer gets, you know, represented. Everyone that I've ever heard of that goes into a into a deal without representation on the buyer side regrets it later, you know, mm -hmm. because they didn't know what was happening to them and they had no one to trust in the transaction. So they think they're saving a few bucks here or there, but really they're not. But what's the long standing rule <coughs> about commissions that we teach our agents? Well, commissions aren't set. You know, there is no fixed commission amount. It's all negotiable. 
And ultimately, whenever a listing agent goes into a, you know, a presentation with the seller or, um, you know, a negotiation with the seller on the listing terms, they tell the seller what they charge and what they offer a buyer's agent who comes in and cooperates with the sale. And, you know, the seller has the right to say no. Right. <laughs> to choose another agent who maybe is, a, you know, a discount Cheaper. agent. Yeah. Right. They have options in how they pay commissions and how much they pay. Right. They don't have to commit. So and it's something that's disclosed. It's written in the contract. In the contract. It's in the freaking contract. And the seller signs this contract, the seller understanding signs. the terms. So in that lawsuit, apparently, they suffered a great deal of what? What did you exactly suffer? They you suffered what the consequences signing, of signing their contract. AKA and when a you sale. sold your house, <laughs> after you sold your house, you turned around probably to buy a house and then you benefited from a buyer's agent as mm -hmm. well, right? Yeah, I'm sure they did. So that's a really good point. You know, nobody's talked about that, mm -hmm. actually. I bet all those people who were in that 500,000 sellers, I bet they all used buyer agents that were paid for by the listing side commission. Mm -hmm. um, to buy that's something. a really, really good point. Yeah. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. Well, I, I think even the fact that there were commissions paid says enough because that's saying that there were successful sales to be had. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the stats on FSBOs or for sale by owners yes. versus properties that are listed in an MLS with an agent, mm -hmm. they sell, I, I want to say that I saw a stat that they, they sell for like 30 to 35% less. Less, of yeah. course. You know? Because what's an agent's job? We yeah. specialize in marketing. We know how to advise our sellers on mm -hmm. how to get the top dollar mm -hmm. from the buyer's market by delivering buyers what they want, what they need, prepping the house for sale, like doing all the things, but also walking through the process, holding deals together when there are hurdles. Like there is a professional value that we add to a transaction. So I'm like, where do you think the general public and the members of this jury got the idea that real estate agents are so overpaid. Right. Mm -hmm. Why would they not side with the contract and instead yeah. side with the idea that our job is not valuable? I, th I think they were deceived from the get-go. I think this this attorney, what's this crutch, catch mark? They're, they're supposedly known to be ambulance chasers. Mm -hmm. The only person making money in this lawsuit is this person. If, if it is true that, I don't know what he earned, or, but the word on the street is that class action lawsuits, the attorneys get 40%. Mm. If he indeed got 40% or whatever amount from of that 1.8 billion settlement, mm -hmm. he made $800 million, okay? Wow. This is why he signed after 10 minutes after that thing. Right, went filed another lawsuit. Filed another lawsuit because right. that was easy and they're only going against big corporations that can actually pay. Right. If you're the seller and say, well, I used this small little mom and pop shop and da 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 to buy my house, well, sorry, I'm not gonna put you on my on my case because I can't take any money from them. There is no right. money. So right. they're only suing the big people for big money. And the difference that was, the difference from his, whatever he got from that settlement, if you divide that by the 500,000 plaintiffs, they get $2,000 a person or something. It's crazy. But this you is know, sort this of is a, I think that people were lie, being lied to whatever they were told and I wasn't in that court, I would have loved to hear the arguments. Who knows something after two and a half hours? Who well, can I, come know, to I know a, what they were, Two and a half hours. No, I'm done. Not, listen, they were showing a podcast. They were showing Keller Williams training guides that used a sample commission. Sample. And they're saying this is a, you know, but I'm like, no matter what you put in any kind of training guide, mm -hmm. what's in the contract is what matters. Did somebody put a gun to your head? Were you signing under duress? I would want to make those sellers prove that they interviewed five agents or 10 agents and that they actually tried to negotiate their commission down and not one of the agents even was willing to even consider anything working with them on any level it's bullshit mm -hmm. right. the whole thing is bullshit and but the most what i'm trying to get to is i think we have reality television in los angeles filmed in los angeles and now miami and other places which you know is really um you know, scripted reality and it's entertainment. And I sometimes love watching it myself, but the thing is it makes our job look really easy. Mm -hmm. And we, Nick and I have had this conversation about we sometimes make our job look easy to our clients because we don't want them to know how hard we're fighting in the background, right? We mm -hmm. don't want them to see us sweat. And I right, remember- so they're not seeing every complicated call. They're not hearing the interactions. They're not dealing with all of the stuff that we're the filter of. right? Yeah. 
we're trying to make it easy for our clients, but in, in trying to make it easy for our clients, we've made our job look like it's overpaid. Fast and easy money, so yeah. So I have said, there are a couple things where I wanna say I told you so right now. <laughs> I have said from the beginning that NAR needed to spend its money educating consumers and campaigns on what it is that realtors do. Instead of making these cute, who's your realtor um, meaningless, uh, commercials, which mean absolutely nothing. They're more stuck on like, does your realtor have an R? Like, it's so stupid. They're not talking about agency. What's the value of a, a buyer agent? Like, what is it that we actually bring to the table? Mm -hmm. They've never done a campaign on the value of agents. And I've said that for a very long time, publicly even, that that's what NAR needs to do. But also, I remember a few years ago on the Inman stage, I was right before the um, CEO of... Um, like homes.com came on. Um, we were talking about, I, I, it's always been my pet peeve that clear cooperation and the policies that NAR have put out, clear cooperation is a policy that requires agents to put a listing in the MLS, were lopsided. They created these shadow MLSs inside of brokerages and it favored big brokerages. So you could tell that there was some insider dealing there. Um, they refused to hear any feedback on it. I went to our state representatives, national representatives, and, and when I was talking about how unfair and imbalanced it actually was, I got a cease and desist letter from our <laughs> association. And I, I, but that's because they didn't want it to be confused that that was their position. But my point is there was nowhere for ordinary real estate agents, licensees who were forced into membership by, with NAR in order to join the MLS. There was nowhere for us to vocalize our dissent. They have not been listening. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read Brad Inman's post on uh, what he posted, I posted it on my Facebook. Um, he it's a mic drop moment mm -hmm. where he says, listen, you've fucked around. You've got sexual harassment lawsuits. The CEO now just left. You didn't have the back of that MLS that we talked about before in, in upstate, you know, it was like in New England that got sued for basically the same thing. I think that was like a test run or something. You know, you don't have the backs of the, of the agents. Mm -hmm. You don't care. It's like you don't have anybody who actually sells real estate making decisions. So in that vein, I'm like, I told you so. I said this was gonna be a problem. C clear cooperation is a big part of what this lawsuit's about because it's saying it mandates that properties be entered into the MLS, therefore mandating cooperation. When even in the code of ethics of NAR, it says there is no requirement for mm -hmm. cooperation. So they're violating their own mm -hmm. um, code of ethics, even just in having this. But so now in Orlando, agents are going to be allowed to enter listings with no cooperating commission. So that's interesting, starting in November, like next this month, a couple weeks. Um, and then wow. in New I York, they're modifying go. the listing agreements so that it says the seller pays the buyer agent directly. So it's no longer a split commission. So mm -hmm. it's not like the listing broker mm -hmm. is offering mm -hmm. a portion of their, um, of their well, commission. As long as the buyer's agent gets, re, uh, you know, gets paid. People don't work for free. Yeah, exactly. You know, and the thing is, and sellers want multiple offers. They want way over asking. That's it. They want all those things. How do you get those things by having yeah. a lot of buyers, agents bring their buyers That's to it. your property? So if we have to now, listing agents have to sell the house and find the buyers. Yeah, it'll be a lot different. Right. It'll be a lot different. It'll, it'll be like be every listing's a pocket listing. Yeah. Which as we've talked about, it's like, why would you market to 500 people when you can market to 500,000 people or yeah. 10 million people or whoever's yeah. looking at all the aggregator sites? Like, right. why would you limit it to such a small population? Yeah. Sellers will quickly learn that if they don't offer a cooperating commission, there aren't going to be as many buyers writing offers, I think. Right, and also, I mean, if they're not operating, uh, offering a uh, cooperating commission and then the listing agents are the ones who now might be forced into dual agency, right? Which if there is are no buyer agents, states. right? Mm -hmm. if, if there are no buyer agents being paid mm -hmm. unless there's a separate a agreement for the buyer themselves to pay the agent directly. Who can afford then, that, right? You know, well, I would just question how many listing agents would want to do dual representation for half 
the cost. Right. Also, <laughs> also, I don't think that that's going to be many because the liability itself is enough. The liability is huge. You're doing twice the work for half the cost. Exactly. And then on top of it, there's no guarantee it's going to be a better transaction because you, lo- you as a seller, lose your advocate. Mm-hmm. Essentially, mm-hmm. it becomes transactional. The seller's agent can't advocate in the same way when they're also representing the buyer. You know, so you lose your. Um, your, your person fighting for you as well to get you know the outcome that you that you want it's just so stupid so my great hope is that it actually doesn't shift things too much there's no industry uh, response to this overall yet as to how this is going to affect things NAR said they are going to appeal which they should I think it's which they should I think 100%. it should have been a mistrial I really don't understand how this judge well ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. It doesn't make any sense. Contracts don't matter. Maybe he's but a scorned it, but seller. But what is the <laughs> optics matter. Right, the scorned <laughs> seller who then used the buyer to buy up. Mm. But how? I think what how? we're learning here is that like there is the, the contract itself, which we have always been taught is so rock solid. It, it clearly says that the listing broker is offering a portion of their commission to incentivize a buyer to bring an, uh, a rep, you know, bring somebody. So it's like right there in the contract mm-hmm. that the sellers probably didn't sign by gunpoint. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It right now, if you just feel like, oh, I left some money on the table. So what were we talking about? It's like if a contractor did shitty work or something. Now we can go back and be like, that contractor paid too much. We paid that contractor too much. Mm-hmm. You know, he got paid way too much to do my kitchen. I calculated it and these cabinets only cost 6000 Why did I pay 10000 for the people to install them? Right. What's I want his my labor money really back. worth? Mm. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's so crazy. Anyway, I'm hoping that there's not, that the response is still like TBD, but it is rocking our real estate world a little bit right now, I think. And then I, have, I watched Morning Joe. I saw Aaron Ross Sorkin, who is a respected journalist on camera talking about shit he does not know anything about the fact that it's never never been negotiable he called it a tax on americans what a tax on americans yeah, our job a good is a tax words, right? on americans yeah yeah I swear, God, I wanted with to... all the other taxes on Americans, yeah, right. yeah. the real taxes yeah. on Americans, it, the cost job. of agency yeah. is the one he can't fathom. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You should be fighting bigger battles. I wanted to yeah. reach through the, to the TV and punch him in the face. Yeah. I sent him a message on Instagram. He hasn't responded yet. But Aaron, if you want to learn how real estate works, please feel free to DM me. I'm happy to come in here and walk you through a fucking contract. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it's been doom and gloom, but we have some good news. And today we have a very special guest, Eddie Arizola, who is the founder of Lobos Boxing Club in Los Angeles. He is a, an advocate for um, citizens of Los Angeles, but he's also a mindset coach and he is a profession, former professional athlete. And he's an all around guy who can help us stay strong in the face of high interest rates and um, doom and gloom news. So I'd like to welcome Eddie Arizola. Welcome, Eddie. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on to our show. So it's been doom and gloom in our industry. Yeah. We're having um, some interest rate issues, although they just ticked down like a little bit today. So if you're, if you're uh, in the market, you should be calling your lender. But even ticking down is still higher than most people are accustomed to. It's really like not buyer's buying power and kind of like the enthusiasm is um, right. But being yeah, a little... one thing here, just shout out. There's a lot of sellers that are willing to do an interest rate buy down. So that's a, an amazing tool. That's true. They'll get you to that rate you're waiting for without competition. Yeah. So, so. sellers will prepay the interest for you so yes. you can have a better interest rate on your one and two. But they have to. Like sellers are going to have to compromise a little bit in order to get deals done. Mm-hmm. right now because buyers buying power has been kind of like nicked and i have to say like buyers that energy is what really moves our industry yeah so the economists know exactly what they're doing when they pull the plug on our industry and unfortunately that leads to a lot of like you know dismal thoughts and you know and i've negativity. had and so much negativity so many yeah. people call me and they're like i don't know what i'm gonna do so we, we brought you on here because we know how strong you are. <laughs> we see your big muscles, Eddie. <laughs> it's a tight shirt. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's funny to say because it's, it's a combination of a lot of things, right? First, when things like this happen, it just shows that this is not for everyone. 
just like in our sports, it's everyone says they want to do stuff and the minute it gets a little bit challenging, they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So, well, you have to learn to adapt, right? You can go in with a plan of how things are going to happen. And then when they don't, you're going to either quit or you're going to find a solution, right? So a lot of people, like, what do you guys view a fight as? Like, what is a fight to you? If I asked you. Um, it's usually um, started by me. And <laughs> <laughs> it usually involves a lot of hair pulling. Okay. What about you guys? Fight, a fight? Yeah, what, what, is, what is a fight to you? A so fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. It's an everyday. No, 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 no. It's it's the everyday struggle when the children don't do their homework. <laughs> okay. oh, That's good. How about you? What is a fight? Uh-huh. Hmm. What is a fight to me? I mean, what what are we talking here? Nick and just... I have almost gotten in a few per- fights. Are we talking? Yeah, I'm going. She she throws stuff. Oh. <laughs> if you mean bows, yeah. <laughs> I've not seen you throw a thing. Right, so you guys almost got into a fight, and then what happened? We did. Um, we resolved it. We, we yeah, we solved, slowly. We solved, we solved, we solved I think the we problem, walked away. Right? Yeah. So fighting is problem solving. And if you have yeah. that, if you have that mentality, then it doesn't matter how big the fight, who the opponent is, what the situation is. You can solve the problem. There's always a solution. There's always a way to do things. You just have to pivot. Maybe you wanted to do things a certain way. And it's not working. Well, if you keep forcing it, it's just going to make it worse. You go, okay, let's go around the other way. Let's let's do something else. Like you just said, that just because one thing isn't going doesn't mean that you can't go a different route. And if you start to apply this mentality to everything, you guys will see. There's always a way to 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 go around this the problem or the situation. You just have to change the mindset from like I'm in a fight to there's a problem in front of me. Let's solve this problem. Mm-hmm. If I look at someone, I'm like, okay, they're bigger, they're stronger. No, you have to go. Okay, that's a problem. What do I have that they don't have? What's my way in? As opposed to going, I'm going to fight them head to head. That's stupid. That's a good thing what you're saying. What do I have that they don't have? Mm -hmm. So I've found that in this type of real estate um, environment, a lot of times this is when rookie agents pull out because they can't make a living, which I'm like, that's fine. Clear the path. It's not for everyone. I've learned that. I've tried to train people to be great agents, but if you don't, have this hunger i don't know that this business is for you mm-hmm. it's probably just like sports the same thing yeah. yeah but also um this is when you can come out so like when people start pulling back on marketing spend or whatever uh this is when you can be seen more right because your competition is kind of like pulling back but a lot of people don't even have the money to market under any circumstances yeah. so it, they have to get more creative yeah and that's the thing <laughs> you, you have to pivot and one of the things you just said too it's for example, one of the drills we do, and I have a I'm very proud of our, we have an amateur team that's mostly female. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things we drill a lot is when you start to get tired, when it gets hard, that's when we push the hardest. So the last 15 seconds, the last 30 seconds of anything we do, that's the hardest, that's the hardest part. That's when you go faster, that's when you go harder. So that when it does get tough and everyone kind of feels like quitting, your instinct is to go harder. Mm-hmm. And then you have that mindset and that just gives you such an advantage because you know it's going to get hard and most people are going to start to quit and, and you're not. You have it in the back of your head that you're just going to push a little bit further and, and you'll get to, to your goal faster than that. I ever. love that. Yeah, well, thank you that for too. that reminder. Yeah, of course. What are you seeing? Like, is there a theme you're seeing now? Because, you know, we live in a real estate bubble, but, mm-hmm. you know, whenever you're training like kids or the people that come in, are you, is there like a narrative happening right now? Yeah, I think, and I think we talked about this the other day. Um, Quitting has become acceptable to so many people. Mm. Like, it, it's just the normal ni- mindset now. Is like, yeah, I'll just quit. If something gets hard, I'll just quit with everything. I'll quit this relationship. I'll quit my business. I'll sell it. Like nobody thinks about okay, let's let's grind this out. Let's let's figure it out. Let's solve the problem. And it, and it starts from when you know when these kids are young. They're allow like our generation. I think was too much. We're like we couldn't do anything. We we were, we had to force our way through things. We weren't allowed to cry. We're not. I think we've overcorrected. Mm. And now this new generation of like 20 year olds that are coming into the workforce have never had tryouts, have never had winning and losing. Uh, they get a trophy for everything. Uh, they don't get they don't get corrected. There is no truth. They can feel whatever they want. So like my generation was don't feel anything. This generation is feel whatever you want. Mm. So what happens is now when things get a little bit tough, they're like, well, I'll just quit. Instead of having the mentality of like quitting is not acceptable. If you quit something small, even something like for us, it's like a workout. It could be a, a regular class and it's like, okay, everyone, one minute nonstop. And you see that person that's just like, I'm embarrassed, I'll just quit, whatever. Okay, if you quit this, 
you'll quit everything else. And you know, I can imagine real estate is very hard because a lot of things are out of your control. You can't control the way things go. No. So when they get hard, you're gonna be like, well, this just isn't for me. I'm gonna go do something. Okay, well, it's gonna go like this always. It's never gonna be always. And that's every, every, every job, every, every industry that I've been in is the same thing. Fitness, sometimes you're feast or famine. People are all training and then you know, around November, December, everybody disappears. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's you know, January, then everyone's back in, everyone's motivated for the next year. And you know, it, it, it's, it all goes back to the mindset, right? Quitting can't be an option. And I think motivation is bullshit. I think it's bullshit. I don't think that motivation, it lasts 30 seconds. You watch uh, you know, David Goggins' speech and I'm like, yeah, 30 seconds. And then after that, I'm like, uh, it's, it's discipline that gets you through. Mm. So you have to have discipline to do the things that you have to do. Like for you guys, it's not you know, do your miles and run. For you guys, is you have to have everything handled. Everything has to be- Right, we need systems. Uh, yeah, constantly. systems have to constantly be in order or when things happen, you're not gonna be ready for it and you'll quit. I was thinking about people who entered this business, say like there are a lot of young like agents that we work with in LA, I'm sure inspired by reality television. <laughs> I used to be a young agent once too. Um, but, Still uh, thanks. Um, but you know, a lot of them have never experienced a market. Like if like they, this, if they're, if like they that. have been working in real estate from their age 20 to age 30, mm -hmm. like the past 10 years, mm -hmm. they never experienced a declining market mm -hmm. or a changing market mm -hmm. or a, a shifting market, you know, at all. And they don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. But see, I think that like, unlike probably you, you see those people and you, you, you try to encourage them. <laughs> well, look, there's some people that are born with grit, you know, like, right. like for example, my kids program, you'll have kids that start sparring. You'll put 10 of them to sparring. One might be the one that's like, yeah, I like this. And you're like, okay, let's keep an eye on him. <laughs> but, for the, but, but for the most part, like kids aren't going to like it because it's hard. I didn't, I wasn't, I was naturally a sensitive kid. I was very nice, sweet. I liked animals. And I slowly, <laughs> I slowly like developed my toughness. It was like over time, it's like the, the boiling crab thing. You know, if you, you put a crab in hot water, it'll jump out. But if you put a bunch of them in there and you slowly turn up the heat, they, they, they get cooked, they don't even realize it. That's, God, that's, 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 that's so sad. But that's, that's, but that's the truth, you know, training is the same thing. If you get forced into something difficult, well, yeah, it's gonna be hard. The majority of people aren't gonna be able to handle it. But if you're constantly putting yourself in hard situations on purpose, mm -hmm. so you can figure out how to get through it, how to solve the problem, then when they happen, you'll be able to get through. And I think people don't do that enough now. Mm. And like you said, these kids that are 30 now, they've, they've had nothing but success because it's been a right. great, we've That's had good saying. economies, like nothing bad has happened. Right. Where, you know, some of us, some of us have, this is our second recession. Like this isn't the right. first time that we've seen this sort of thing. So like, they don't know how to handle any sort of problem. And, and because they didn't have it in their upbringing, like the schools didn't have it, they didn't have tryouts, they didn't all the stuff that we said, well, yeah, they're going to freak out and they're not going to be able to respond like you need to. And it goes back to, to the training we do, right? So a reaction is something natural, right? If I do this and you flinch, that's a reaction. Mm -hmm. Response is the tra training you give yourself. Response is moving and countering back. That's a response. Right. If you guys don't have responses set up for when bad things happen, then you're just going to have a reaction and, and freak out. Which and I kind of think is something that has happened. Yeah. Like, oh, every, every, yeah. yeah. <laughs> response, I mean, um, reactions yeah. to things. Yeah, so, so, so I think a lot, a lot of the, what's happening for you guys is out of your control, right? Mm -hmm. It'll Whether it be the economy or other people are making decisions for you that shouldn't be making decisions, some of it's not anything you control. All that right. you can do is train yourself and be as prepared as possible and whatever that with a means, response with a response so that you can respond to whatever it is it, it's like um I, I i don't remember what coach i had but i remember him telling me that you know boxing is a conversation right and the more articulate you are the more you can control a situation the more mm -hmm. you control a conversation if i know three words i'm going to sound really stupid and the only thing i'm gonna be able to do is get louder and angry mm. right which is useless but if i'm articulate doesn't matter what we talk about. I'm going to I'm going to be the lord of language and, and, and control where this conversation goes. And, and I think real estate business, the more skills you have, the more knowledge you have, the easier it is to, to maneuver whatever happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you have oh, to like be able that. to control the mm -hmm. conversation. So the lord of language. Yeah. So become articulate, become articulate, in whatever your business is. If it's, you know, for us, I use boxing and martial arts because if you can remain calm and someone's throwing punches at you and you can solve those problems, then business is easier you know like I, my first time owning a business it was six months in COVID started right and that was not I, didn't, I wasn't prepared but in my head I was like okay what do you teach your students don't be full of shit like you gotta you gotta you gotta back up what you're saying okay so what did you do 
I solved the problem. I, I adapted. I, you know, I did privates. I did this. I tried stuff online. I shut the doors. I, I covered the windows and had people, whoever was willing to come in and train. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I, did. I did. And here's the other thing too, I think, and you guys must get this because of reality TV. People assume that they watch this and you're just going to walk in and go straight to million dollar listings. And, and you know, it's, it's glamorous. There's a grind to it. You have to do things you don't want to do. You have to maybe change your car, change your this and, and, and adapt so that you can move forward and, and let your, your ego get out of the way. I think sometimes our ego and the, the character we develop of ourselves takes over what what's most important, which is getting the job done or your business itself. And I, I think social media, reality TV has kind of damaged our perception of what success is. Well, I know in our industry, we have a major problem or for some people it's a solution, but we have an optics situation mm. going on. So there's the, the reason why I think the jury was so easily able to side with the plaintiffs, even though they signed a contract without a gun to their head. So I don't know how that got through, like we talked about, and I'm going to keep saying because it's so awful and annoying and just unjust. It's the perception of real estate agents as used car salesmen that is allowing people to kind of no matter what, they're like, I'm going to screw that guy because yeah. he charged me too much. You know, yeah. they just love to feel that feeling like we're getting charged too much. Despite the fact that our government is robbing us and raping us every day. hundred oh, percent. I mean, yeah. the whole paying tax dollars with post tax, the whole tax, everything tax thing and having absolutely no accountability and control really drives me personally nuts. And real estate agents get a ton of that too because mm -hmm. we're independent contractors and we suffer a lot yeah. in and, the tax department. And, and, and even what you just said was they want somebody to blame, which goes back to the, they vic want the victim to mentality. Yeah. They can't take accountability for not knowing what they're doing or, or making a bad decision. It's, right. it's always someone else's. Everything gets diverted to someone else. Right. No, one, no one can take accountability for their actions. Someone's fat, it's because of genetics. It's not because they eat like shit and don't, mm. don't work out, don't right. sleep. It's someone's fault. It's, it's always someone else's fault. Right. So you, you have to take accountability for everything that, 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 that you're involved in. Otherwise, you're not solving the problem. You're right. Just, you're just bitching. And if well, I think also there's this idea of like good versus like they keep it good versus bad. Right. Mm -hmm. They're the bad. There's the bad people. Those are the ones who make money off of us good people's equity. Mm -hmm. And it's like, are you forgetting the entire profession, like the specialty, the specialization of what it is that I do? Because if you ask somebody who is married to a realtor, how hard we work, <laughs> the hours were available, the depth of the knowledge that we have, that the the um, the imagination we have to have to be able to jump certain hurdles and the like the persistence we have to have because just like in uh, acting for example you're only as good as your last sale like you have to keep getting business and earning business in order to sustain yourself and that's it's exhausting but we do it and we do it because we love the feeling of victory for our clients mm -hmm. you know I'm like who are they interviewing on the TV shows are they interviewing real estate agents no. Are they, they ever asking us how we feel? No. Or like what it is that we're doing? No. None of that was part of this conversation. It was all about perception. It's about the perception of the training manuals and the, you know, the perception of agency and the perception of, of overpayment. Yeah, well, that's, let's and, talk you about know, money again and who made the money in this lawsuit. Just saying. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. the lawyers did their job. Yeah, that's well, their job. Are they not overpaid? That's a question I'd like to pose yeah. to the jury. Also, the fact that you can even have a lawsuit of that magnitude. That right. Our legal system is set up for something like that. Right. So if you're if you are in our industry shoes, right, and mm -hmm. you were like Courtney, when you feel this way, because I'm all worked up. Mm -hmm. What should I do? <laughs> But physically, well, what, every, should I throw a punch? You want to teach us how to? Well, how do we I mean, land a good so, punch? so so for me, I think <laughs> if if you look at, uh, so our gym was rooted in philosophy, like Stoics, um, even Buddhism, like everything goes back to balance. You can't have too much of one thing. You have to have balance. You, I'm not a fan of like the alpha male meatheads, like. And you also can't go the opposite route of being too sensitive, right? There has to be balance, right? So if your body is in balance, if if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not healthy, if you're not this, well, you're going to make bad decisions. You're going to get worked up. You're going to let your emotions control you instead of channeling your emotions. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to take care of yourself first and you have to create that balance in your life. It, it can't be all work and it can't be all play. So the first thing you got to do is take care of yourself. And if your body's right, your mind's going to be right and vice versa. If your mind's not right, your body's not going to be able to Do you guys perform. meditate? 
Yeah. So one of the things we do is used to people think used to think I was weird. At the end of class, everyone sits down, everyone closes their eyes. We meditate for like two to three minutes, or we do breath work two to three minutes every class. Hmm. And you know, I was someone that, that couldn't sit still for mm-hmm. a long time and I learned how to do it and it's changed everything even even if you just you have you know 15 minutes in your car and less than that you can take five minutes in your car and just do deep breaths and I'm telling you it makes a big difference and it sounds cheesy and stupid but all my fighters started doing it and you see the difference they're just a lot more calm they can solve problems they get their nerves in, in order um, and the people I train like some of the high performance people I train same thing I know that when you're making decisions that are million dollar decisions that's, I mean, that's stress. It's mm-hmm. not getting punched in the face, but it's the same type of stress. Like you can't, you, it's like uh, just diffusing a bomb. You can't make mm-hmm. a mistake. And if you do, it can cost people's lives or people's, right. people's livelihoods, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. livelihoods which yeah. in, in turn can cause lives. And, and I know for a lot of people right now, there's a lot of stress. Like you could lose everything and, 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 and you know, you could lose people you care about because they, you know, something bad like that happens. Who are your gurus? Who are, who do, who are you inspired by? Um, in life or just in general? Books, life, um, general, social media accounts, whatever. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't like gurus. I, I think you should be inspired by the people around you. Like I have a few mentors. I actually lost one of my close friends this week. Um, mm. And uh, he, you know, he was having trouble with, with finances and stuff. And, and he, uh, he ended up moving on. Um, but I, I think I, I like people that understand that, that it's, it's about bettering yourself overall it, it, it has nothing to do with with physique i don't care if you have a six pack that doesn't mean shit to me as long as you're disciplined and you're healthy great i don't care if you have 100 million dollars or you make a hundred thousand dollars as long as you're taking care of the things you need to take care of i think that's that's success so anyone that promotes that sort of stuff i think is great you know i think you have you know, any favorite books or anything you recommend to mm, your I, I was a big i was a big fan of jordan peterson um I like his mentality. I like, you know, his, his, his views on discipline and, and, you know, something as simple as cleaning your room. If you have a clean room, you have a clean mindset. I read um, this thing that make said, your bed every morning. Make your bed that every sets morning. the tone for the day. Yeah. I, I and read my this kids thing that mock said, me when I say that. They do? <laughs> yes. They don't make their beds. They won't do anyway. it. You tell them to. <laughs> yeah, I think that you just got to tell them to do it. It's, it's, it goes back to discipline, right? Yeah. If, 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 it, if they, they fight with you at first, that's fine. But eventually, they're just going to get used to doing it, and then it becomes habit. I read this. I read this uh, thing that said, if, if you're a landlord and you want to interview a tenant, don't interview the tenant. Ask them to show you their car, because the way they take care of their car is how they'll take care of your property. That's very true. Interesting. But then it goes. Yeah. Go, that thing goes yeah, into personalities. Like you ever seen? Um, you show like uh, this is getting in trouble, but it, the difference between men and women. So you'll see a woman's house or bathroom is like super clean or the apartment's super clean, their car's a mess. And you'll see a guy's room or his apartment's super messy, but his car is like immaculate. <laughs> oh, that's so, interesting. So Why do you think go- that is? It's just, they just where we put our priorities. We mm-hmm. think like a guy will have, he'll live in a complete pigsty mm-hmm. and then his car is like perfect. <laughs> and then you'll see like a girl, and then you'll see like They're a girl's clean. apartment is so clean and you go in her car and there's nowhere to sit in the front seat. You're like, Why is there 17 water bottles in the front seat? <laughs> And I'm sure, yeah, I think you guys are laughing because it's true. So it just, it goes, my it goes, person, it, it goes personality. My um, car is clean. And look, oh so, some, God, some very smart so people, funny. some very smart people are messy. I, I think, that I think sometimes so you just, your, your, your organization gets put into other areas because you only have so much bandwidth, right? And what, what decisions you can make in a day. And I think you prioritize where you're going to put your neatness mm-hmm. or where you're going to put your organization. Um, well, you know, we talked about our eight, like our industry and that kind of a thing. But um, do you, you know, do you think that um, in your experience training people and kind of coaching people that you've encountered a lot of like, I don't know, people who are hesitant to take risks? A hundred percent. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of our buyers right now, like it's, I know we say it all the time, but the truth of the matter is. When the interest rates come down and the industry is flooded again with buyers, you are going to be like, is it the right time to buy? Because now it's 25 offers on a property. And, you know, I thought it was going to be more affordable because the interest rates were lower. Now I'm paying $200,000 more. Like, don't be stupid and paralyzed. Let's look at where your opportunity is. And the reality is if you find something you love right now and you can afford it right now, you can refinance later and get an even lower mortgage payment in the future, but now is the time to buy. Mm -hmm. How many times do we have to freaking say it? But 
people are just risk averse. Like they go with the go with the you know whatever they yeah they're like whatever the, the bad news is they'll go yeah all their friends stopped looking they'll stop looking all their friends started buying they want to buy you know yeah. mm-hmm. how can you what's what's it's very fad mentality people kind of do what everyone else is yeah. doing yeah and I think it goes back to understanding the value of what you guys do mm. and more people that care like you guys I think need to be outspoken Ahead explain of, and explain right. to these people like hey we're here to help you because the climate is probably you know they're just trying to screw you over like a car salesman or like someone right. else so then they're going to listen to whatever they they hear because they're they're trying to protect themselves also i think when it comes to pulling the trigger that's that goes back to just people are people are scared in general they don't they don't train how do you that. coach them out of being scared if you're so, us. so 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 let me give you an example i do um women's self-defense seminars and one of the <laughs> biggest things i hear for women that have had attacks or have is that they didn't do anything they, oh, they just froze they froze because you have to train them. And I know, I know grown men that competed and that trained their whole life and they didn't train that part of their brain. Okay. And in the ring, they're monsters. But when something happened in real life, they froze. Okay. Because you have to train that response. You have to train that, okay, the most important thing is to react, yeah. whatever it is. So the first thing we do is we do drills where we'll have, okay, we're gonna do 15 seconds of being calm and passive. When you hear the bell, it's five seconds of full on violence. Like whatever comes out, comes out. I don't care if it's ugly, the technique doesn't matter, just be able to flip that switch. Mm. And if you have that mentality, you see the top business guys all have that, they're kind of crazy. You know, they have that mentality, like they can turn it on. A lot of these guys are training martial arts now, they're boxing and doing things because they need to train their minds to be sharp and to, to make a decision and respond mm. and, and react the way you need to. Um, I think most people now don't do that. So when they do have an opportunity, they freeze mm. or they're so scared of losing because they've never lost before that they won't take the risk. But a lot of us, we've lost a bunch. We know if I lose, okay, I'll get back up, I'll do it again. If I lose money, it's the same thing. There's right. no difference. You can always make more money. You can always get back up. You can always try another another business. But if you've never lost before, losing is the scariest thing on earth because you have no idea what that means. You don't have no idea how much you're gonna lose. So you've trained people how to lose. You have to learn how to lose. You're gonna yeah. have, look, it, when you train, especially when you start competing, and, and this is why like, we'll start with a competition team of 20 people and it'll end up being six. You know, the Navy mm-hmm. SEALs, the same, you know, those guys, like I have buddies that are SEALs and they said, we'll start with 50 guys. And by the end, there's like 10. And out of those 10, there's five that are good, you know? And because it's not, it, it, everyone can't handle that, 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 that sort of um, pressure. But if you train it and you put yourself in, in, in hard positions all the time, you'll, you'll be able to react better than other people. You'll be willing to take that risk because you know I've lost. In the ring, you get your ass kicked most of the time. You're not always the man. You're not always on top. You're gonna do rounds with people. There's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody better than you, more experienced. But if you're willing to go in and chase the the top dog all the time, then you'll be okay with losing. But yeah, I'll get my ass kicked today, but I'm gonna get better. I'm right. gonna learn right. whatever whatever mistakes you make. Did you guys watch, um, change, stay on subject, but uh, Elon Musk documentary about SpaceX? Mm-hmm. I haven't. I didn't either. Okay, so what I found was interesting, especially as a coach, so you had Boeing, um, I forgot the other two companies that were competing with SpaceX. What Elon did that I thought was so interesting that nobody else is doing is all of us inherently go for perfection on every try. We try to be perfect every time, try to be perfect every time. So Boeing would take six months to do one launch and then it would fail and then they would be like, okay, cool, let's just try to be perfect again. Elon was sending a rocket every other day up and what he would do is when it would go up, the failures, he would just fix all the failures and then do it again and then fix all the failures. So he was getting so much more done than these other guys that were trying to be perfect each time because they were so scared of failing where he was just like, let's just keep messing up and then I'll fix up the screw ups as opposed to trying to be perfect. Because mm. nothing's gonna be perfect. The market's never gonna be perfect. It's never gonna be the right time. It's never the right time to have a kid. It's never the right time to get married. Like, right. There's always can be better. You just have to do it. You just have to pull the trigger and then solve the problems as they go. Mm. Same thing with fighting. It's like I have people that say they want to be fighters. They say they want to do stuff. Well, the right time. I just I got to get my weight. I got no. You just train. Get good at boxing, yeah. and then everything else will fall into place. The weight will come off. This will happen. But you have to do the work. You can't say, well, when the right time. There is no right time. Right. No, that's so true. I thought I mean, when I opened my gym, I was like, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Yeah, I didn't want to open my own gym. I was like, I like being able to do other things. I train in other people's gyms. Like, do my own thing and not have to stress about rent and all that stuff. And then they're like, Eddie, the, the economy, this is the best time. It was uh, end of 2019. The economy was crazy. My, everyone has money, blah, blah, blah. All right, cool. I'll listen. I did it. <laughs> Six months in, COVID. Worst time ever to have a gym. And of course, like, you know, California closed gyms. 
they left liquor stores and, and everything else open, but they closed gyms. We needed we need, to drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we also needed to be healthy, and they closed all of our gyms. And I was like, great. Like, I thought it was the perfect time, and it ended up being the worst time to open a gym. Right. But again, I, what did I do? I said, okay, I can cry about it and say, oh, poor me, first time owning my own gym. I'm just going to quit. Or I say, fuck this. Like, that's, it's, you problem solve it. And this is where I, you know, I figured out everything in life is if you apply it to a fight. A fight is long. 12 rounds, right? This right now, just a bad round. It's a bad round. You can come back from a bad round. Just fucking stay on your feet, use the shit you know, defense, whatever it is, weather the storm. <laughs> Those motherfucker might get tired, right? Hmm. The other guys are I gonna like quit. That. I like that too. And then you yeah, got like you got more gym. rounds left to win the yeah, fight, right? But if you go, oh, I can't, there's no, I don't see a way out. Okay, well, yeah, you're right. But if you say, okay, let me just weather the storm, and then see what comes out afterwards. There's, there's more rounds. If I got time, there's always time. There's always time. You just have to get through it. And, and your training, whatever you guys do to prepare, that's what gets you through the bad rounds. And then you end up winning the fight long term. It's, 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 it's not a sprint. It's an endurance race. That's and, a really, and, really great place to yeah. end it. Thank you Perfect. so much. Yeah, that's you're welcome. Amazing. How can people find you? Um, so uh, the gym's in Melrose and La Brea. It's Lobos Boxing Club. So we have an Instagram at Lobos Boxing Club. Um, and then mine is at EddieArizola.com. And or just a side note, you're also like an actor. Are you still doing that? I, I, I stopped during COVID. Okay, and, uh, gotcha. So I did, I, I had a film about fighting actually uh, that I did in Australia last year and that's coming. But we also had a, a strike. So same thing. I came, <laughs> I, came, I, came, I came back after COVID. I'm like ready to do it again. I did one movie and then they're like actor strike. I was like, cool, going back to fitness. <laughs> I pivoted. Same thing. So it's like every time you think things are good. You just gotta, you just gotta adapt. Yeah, we're in a strike right now. So. Yeah, I was acting for. I did one movie and then I went right back to striking. Yeah, so now I'm back into doing coaching. Got so. it. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll look out for you anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on Under All the Land. We'll we have, have you guys so much soon, out of that. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, we're gonna, we're coming to the gym. With the a special episode. episode. So stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming. Yes. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. There are a lot of great takeaways in what Eddie was saying. I mean, I feel like mm -hmm. really honestly looking at this moment, because we have all three of us talked about this moment being maybe like a cleansing, a time for restructuring, a time for, you know, really like energizing your next move mm -hmm. and giving real thought to that. Um, there have been so many changes that have happened just in our industry, in our brokerage, in our industry, with our clients. Like there's just so much going on right now that's saying it's time to move things around a little bit, right? Yeah. So, sure. you know, I feel like that idea of it being like around in a fight is a really good way of thinking about it. That's, yeah, for that's sure. Yeah, I like that too. I love that. Yeah, not everyone will make it through the round. That's for sure. Not everybody will. And but like, the strong will. Yeah. Smart will, yeah. Discipline will, and I, I think that we have that. So I'm it's not... also much needed in a way because yeah. there's just too many people running rampant. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to find the word. Yeah, and, and to wrap, bring it back to the NAR thing. For me, it's like the takeaway is we cannot trust that our association that takes our money we'll to promote our, our interests, actually knows what our interests are, is actually gonna spend our money to promote our interests, actually cares what we feel or think or how it is on the ground. I, I'm, I have lost complete faith in that idea. So I think then the onus is on us to educate our clients better. So clients, if we're gonna do a meeting, we're probably gonna have a bigger conversation around what it is that we do, how we earn our commission, why we earn our commission, why we're so valuable. Like that might get annoying for some people, but you know, if they're not gonna do it, then we're gonna have to do it. That's my, that's my thought. Yeah. True that. Okay, all right. Anybody have anything else to say? I think you said it well. <laughs> <laughs> Just okay, I'm glad we're back. <laughs> I'm so happy to be back. I'm so yeah. glad we're back. We'll see you next time on Under All is the Land. Bye. 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 Um, you're in the shot now and every time you do that oh, just I'm FYI so I'm just letting him know he's gonna cut that out coming to you live from Acme Real Estate in Los Angeles